I was saying that you can't not love the character of Khulud al faqih and what she um, managed to achieve and the way we see her as the judge and the woman and the social, uh, you know, the, the, the social worker and, and the way she tries to help women from, um, how, from, from the, the, the position that she has. However, she remains an exception with a few others. And um, can we talk a little bit about the lack of women judges in the Middle East in this space? Sharia law is not a, a, a section of the law that we often hear about. And you know, we, we have none in, in the Middle East. We have a few in Palestine since 2009. Although women judges have been appointed in other areas. Can you speak a little bit about that for the Middle East? Um. Thank you for hosting me. Of course. Um, and and um, let's just thank Erica Cohen for making an amazing movie and introducing us to the difficulty of the life of, of uh, Al Judge Al Faqih. This is what I'm going to call her, Judge uh -huh. Al Faqih. Um, um, and hats off to her. I mean, what Absolutely. she's doing is amazing, and the way she's carrying herself and struggling for women and trying to literally be a a trailblazer in the way that she is, is incredible. Um, I think there are other uh, female judges in family courts. There's certainly in Jordan. There's also in Egypt. Uh, there's in Tunisia. Um, so um, it's rare, but it's not impossible. And I think a way of understanding what's going on in Palestine is actually to think of Palestine as a piece of the whole of the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And to sort of, and, won't, and uh, what, one clarifying aspect would be is if we think of the Arab countries in, in relation to Sharia law and to women's presence in these courts, is to think of them as sitting on a spectrum. So they're more liberal countries or more conservative countries. Mm -hmm. Palestine sits on the conservative wing of the spectrum, right? Um, it has literally inherited the personal status law of Jordan, which was passed in 1967. Jordan went ahead and, and issued a new one, but I don't think the Palestinians have. I think they made some amendments to their law. I think that law applies only to the West Bank. The Gazans are influenced by Egypt because in 1960, um, before 1967, uh, they were occupied. After 48, they were occupied by the Egyptians, and so the influence is Egyptian on them. And the West Bank, because it was under annexed by Jordan mm -hmm. in 1952, it was it followed Jordanian laws until 67 when the Israelis occupied it. But it went on applying uh, Jordanian law. We get to the idea of Sharia court really um, when we understand that the jurisdiction of Sharia or Islamic law is simply what is, hap is, is a form of a shrinkage of the, of the historic um, jurisdiction of Islamic law. Islamic law used to just regulate practically everything. Uh -huh. And then every other field of law, civil, commercial, criminal, started to be influenced by European codes and became secularized. And what has happened is Islamic law just withdrew and shrank, and we ended up with only questions of family law um, being influenced by Sharia, right? And what, what these areas are, are in essence divorce, uh, marriage, divorce, inheritance, and estates or wills, right? These are the only uh, areas of the law in the whole of the Arab world that Islamic law has any jurisdiction over. And one way of looking at this is as a form of the historic defeat of Islamic law, right? It used to uh, it's have jurisdiction over criminal law, civil law, commercial law, but now it shrank, and this is its only area of adjudication. And that makes the people who affiliate with the system, religious men, Sharia men, people with these, mm -hmm. that wear these things, even more attached to it. 
and even more uh, trenchant in insisting on not amending it because it's literally the only domain that they have any power over. And they've lost everything else. So that's one way of thinking about these religious men and how tenacious they are of not accepting a woman entering their domain, because if a woman enters their domain, that would just be the big and uh, another yet defeat that, that they will be suffering. And it would just mean that the liberal forces in the society having just stolen every other field of law is now literally entering their privileged domain. And piercing and that, in there. And that's unbearable, right? And it's literally unbearable for another reason, not just because it's the jurisdiction of Islamic law, but because it's the family, right? Yes. It is the family. And it, in a sense, it's also, when you think about it, especially for Palestine, mm -hmm. like we have been, we've lost our land. We have been made refugees. We've lost every war we've had with Israel. This is a vanquished society, right? And literally what holds us together is the family unit. And it is perceived as this sacred. Yes, and yes. it's a bastion of yes. who we are. Yes. And so to start to loosen that up, that's also deeply threatening. So it's layer on layer of resistance. The conservative men use um, the tradition that's attributed to the prophet that says women have no reason. Women um, uh, uh, no reason, no religion. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. To say women cannot be judges in the sense that they're not rational enough. They're too emotional. How can you leave your a woman who is irrational by by biology adjudicate your affairs? That's what they use. And of course, on the other end, the liberal forces in the society that want women to enter this domain. Uh -huh. And you have to understand that the liberals have a very, very good argument for this. These are rules on the family. And Absolutely. they are being adjudicated by men. This is the most the area of life that is most touching on women, surely women need to adjudicate these cases, and women need to enter the domain, and we need to have the female perspective, both as litigant, as advocate, and as judge. And remember, Khulud used to be an advocate yes. in the court, and uh -huh. that's the paradox of her situation. You can let women into the Sharia court, and they could act as lawyers, but God damn it, they can't no, they be, can judges. be judges. It's a, a real paradox, right? Yeah. You can represent women in these courts as a lawyer, but, but we can't let you actually be the judge, right? So the forces of resistance are way too high, but it's, it's shifting and it's actually changing. The Egyptians found a way of kind of going around this whole system by creating a thing that they called family court, and the argument was, well, you do need women judges because they get it more than men, right? Yes, right? right. So it's like the particularity <laughs> argument. Women get divorce, uh, domestic violence, uh, nafa or maintenance. Yes. Yes. They women get other women, and surely you have a you need to have a female judge who can understand all these female litigants coming to the court, and they they were able to do it in family courts, but they're still struggling. Say in the on the high administrative court in Egypt, they still refuse to appoint women. They did it in the high um, in the in the constitutional court, but not in the high administrative court. And it's literally for Egypt, it's. It's a court system by court system, you know, that you have to just wage an independent struggle. Let me go back to the idea of the spectrum. Yes. If Palestine sits on the most conservative, Tunisia is the most liberal. And anyone following the news on Tunisia, Tunisia is literally on its last leg of completely liberalizing Islamic law. And I mean liberalizing it. I mean absolute, total, formal equality for men and, and women, women at every level of the system, including not just women having no full divorce, not just women and the men understood as sharing together the, the maintenance obligations of the family. Women, Muslim women, are able to marry non-Muslim men. This is huge. Yeah. This is mm -hmm. huge. Mm. And women having the same share of inheritance 
again huge with absolute massive consequences for property distribution in Tunisia. That's, that's fantastic because there was a very strong civil society also in Tunisia Absolutely. that drove Absolutely. this Absolutely, and it was their agenda. revolution that triggered the Arab Spring, right? Yeah. Tunisia is, has a very strong liberal bastion, especially in mm -hmm. Tunis, and they have historically, from the 50s, passed an incredibly progressive family law under the reign of Burqayba. Mm -hmm. Burqayba was deeply influenced by the French and, and he worked incredibly hard at limiting the power of the and neutralizing the, the religious establishment and said, listen you dudes, you have to accept women are equal to men, no polygamy, no you can't have more than one wife, are you kidding me? No women don't <laughs> need to obey their husbands and yes women can divorce, can have a right to divorce and they don't need to explain to anyone why they have to do a right. He's already done that in the 50s. Yes. What they're doing now is finishing by giving women equal shares in, of inheritance and allowing women to marry non-Muslim men. This is absolutely revolutionary. Palestine, on the other side. In Palestine, marriage is considered to be nominally a contract, right? You, end, you marry, it's marriage is, is offer and acceptance. A man offers to marry a woman, she says yes. And as the judge said, women on principle can stipulate anything they want in the contract. Um, I've seen, I've read reports of poor women in Egypt um, stipulating, say that the husband provides them with at least half a kilo of meat a week. And that's written in the marriage contract. Or women can stipulate she will need to use contraceptives the first three mar uh, years of the marriage. He needs to agree to that so that she can finish her PhD before, before they have children. She can do that. But what she cannot do is stipulate something that the courts will determine to be against the spirit of the marriage contract, right? For mm -hmm. instance, she can say, if you marry another woman, I will have a right to divorce you. She could do that. Mm -hmm. But she cannot say, you cannot marry another, another woman. woman. Correct. Right? Okay. She can say, I, we need to use contraceptives, but she cannot say, I, we can only have sex once a week. Right? That is considered to be against the spirit of the marriage contract. So there are limits to this contract, right? To this and to the framework. It's in a which framework, it's right? You can bargain. And now most women don't bargain. In fact, you have a bad reputation if you bargain. Right? Yeah. That's a bad start yeah. for any marriage. You and start bargaining your contract who wants to marry you, yeah, right? Absolutely. And we've seen in the movie how they say regularly that you right. know it is in the culture, women should not speak out, right. should not bargain, exactly. do not even know. Exactly. A lot of them do not even know their rights. Exactly. Yes. Now, now, to think about the, a, a very basic idea about this marriage contract that that the Tunisians have completely loosened up is the idea that what this contract is about really fundamentally is that men maintain women in marriage, financial obligations is squarely on their shoulders, mm -hmm. in return women obey them. And mm -hmm. obedience, and that is the word used in the law, of many, many personal status quotes in the Arab world, but its meaning is sexual. Mm. So there is, as in the movie, there's no such notion as marital rape, mm -hmm. right? You basically have to sleep with your husband to earn your maintenance, basically. That's, and if you look at the definition of marriage of practically every personal status quo code in the Arab world, there is some formulation to that effect that the marriage of contract is a marriage of sexual access for the husband in return for financial obligations Nations. for the woman. That's the contract, right? Now, that then creates a system of what we call hukuk wajibat, which means duties and rights, right? It's not rights and liberties, that's a different thing. It's duties and rights, right? For my duty to fa a financial obligation, I have rights in your directions. But what is extremely important to understand is that in Islamic law, when women marry, they retain their own juridical personality. They don't merge with that of the husbands, which is what used to be the case in the West in, uh, mm -hmm. in before the modern reforms of marry law, uh, family law. They retain their name and they return their property. And the husband has absolutely no claim on their financial 
the fi what, what finance, what money and property they bring to the marriage, he has zero. There is like a circle around her he cannot touch. That's hers. Incredible. What the Tunisians have done, and so in return for that, he maintains her, right? Even if she has money, mm -hmm. that's money is hers. Whether she enters marriage, he maintains her. So he's obligated to feed her, to pay for her medical expenses, to put her in a decent home, even to get her a maid if that's what she's used to. She has zero obligations. She doesn't have an obligation to even support her children, even if she works, right? So the Tunisians came to this, but in return she has to obey him. The Tunisian looked at the system and said, okay, you don't have to obey him. If you don't want sex, you don't have to sleep with him. And yes, there is something called marital rape, right? But now you're a unit, and you're both financially obligated to, to maintain the family, which meant that the circle around her has been broken. So if he's unemployed, she's employed, he can sue her for maintenance. I see. That's the trade-off the yeah. Tunisian made. Okay. Right? Release your property, right? And now you're my equal. Mm -hmm. In the system in Palestine, there's no way a husband can take his wife to court, supposing he's an employee, she works as a school teacher. I want her to buy me cigarettes, mm -hmm. right? Cannot do that. Because by law, it's his obligation. In Tunisia, he, he can. Right, to see what the trade-off is. So men in the Tunisian model lose all the privileges they have as a result of being the financial supporters. And they have, and, and in Palestine, they have many privileges. Like uh -huh. they have to approve of the marriage of their daughters. It's their say. Women have no say, mm -hmm. right? They, um, if, if there's divorce, they maintain the children and then they get to decide which schools the children go to. Good. What, what doctor they see, right? Uh, whether they go to college or not, who they marry or not, women don't, don't. But once you basically say, oh, we want to have access to your own juridical uh, personality, your property, open that, and you are now equal to the husband, the women, he loses all these privileges, but she is under threat of having her property now exposed to claims by children, by husbands, and that's, it's literally what we're missing is they're moving from a very conservative system where men have, it's hierarchical, men have financial obligations and in return for them they get a lot of privileges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Women are free from financial obligations, get to be, make this money, but they are subordinate in the contract to a liberal system, like more like a market system, right? Where you're now weighing in it together, you're both responsible for the family. And you and both have no obligations. And there is no hierarchy. Yes. It's formal mm -hmm. equality. Mm -hmm. And so family laws in the Arab world sit on this spectrum with Palestine, Jordan being on the maybe Saudi Arabia. We can always go to the right. We get yes. to the Saudis. There's always right? one. <laughs> More to the right, the Tunisians to the left, Egyptians are somewhere right here, Algerians are here, so they're distributive. And they keep making reforms. And what feminists are doing in all these countries is going push, 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 push. to get to Tunis. Fantastic. Thank you so much right. for this incredible insight into family law uh, and Sharia law. Right. There's something else I want to say yes, before please. people ask. Uh -huh. Look at the courtroom that she functioned in, right? It's, um, it's a very personal place, right? If you look, it's not like a courtroom in the United Absolutely. States. It looks more like an office. Um, there are no visible lawyers who are presenting. It's basically the claimants who are presenting their cases. It's a system that depends on oral testimony. That's mm -hmm. why people keep mm -hmm. swearing oaths to be saying the truth. So the judge depends on the testimonies of people who know them, their neighbors, their friends, their relatives, about what he makes, does he beat That's her, did you hear anything, swear by God this is true, and then she makes a decision, right? So it's much more like a mediation court that's premised on hearing what people have to say. It's not document oriented, it's not about written, it's not systematized even. Um, and in that sense, it's sort of, if you watch her life, there is this amazing continuity between what she's doing in the courtroom, 
her conversations with her female friends, with her relatives, in her private life. There is this Absolutely, easy, and her calls on the neighbors and on, right. yes, right. Her, her personal okay. calls. So yes, I'm done. Absolutely. You can ask her, sorry, absolutely. I too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for this professor. Um, so let's open the floor. I see one, two, three. Okay, four. Okay, we'll, we'll get you. Let's start in the back, and then here in the front, and then the two ladies. The hats that the uh, Sharia court just judges wore seem to be identical to uh, Turkish clerics. And I'm wondering if that's a souvenir of Ottoman times. And if, in fact, these Sharia judges, some of them are clerics and some aren't, or oh, they all are, or they all aren't. Um, and, and second, may I ask, uh, is there any bucking of cases from the Sharia system to the um, uh, civil system when satisfaction is na not achieved, or vice versa? Um, the, as for your second um, question, this has been introduced in Israel for... Uh, because in Israel, every community, the Jews go to the Jewish religious courts, Muslims go to the Muslim courts, and Christians and Druze like, likewise. What Israeli feminists have managed to do is introduce a civil law on marriage, right? That's much more equal than all the religious laws in Israel. And they allowed women that, whose cases go into these religious courts who get unsatisfactory rulings to appeal to the civil court system. And the civil court system can actually overturn the decision oh. of these religious courts if they found them atrociously unjust. That doesn't exist anywhere in the Arab world. You can't go, if, if a religious judge has basically ruled your case uh, in an atrocious way, right, by saying, oh, he has a right to beat you. By the way, I've written, I've read cases in which um, uh, judges in Egypt uh, discuss what, is, what does it mean to obey your husband and whether um, be, uh, uh, the, uh, men have a right to beat the wife to discipline her as part of their obedience, the right to her obedience. And there are many cases with very conflicting ideas of whether he does or not. But that, um, and they would say things like, uh, you read cases that say, well, you know, peasant women, they're used to more beating than rich women, and therefore what you would consider intolerable for a rich woman, you wouldn't find, to you would actually tolerate for a peasant woman. You've heard in a movie the way she was trying to, the judge, the way she was trying to estimate how much income the woman <laughs> is is entitled to, well, if you lived poor, you wouldn't be entitled to a maid, but if you're rich, he's obligated to pay the salary of a maid in your house. So it's a class-based system as well. But this was, the, the question of beating was um, moderated by the fact that many of the reforms in family law introduced the idea that women can get divorced if they prove the husband beat them. And that came up in the movie many yes. times. Many of the cases that are coming to court, women, their husbands are beating them thinking that's part of their um, right. And the, and, the and the court said, no, a woman can get divorced if you beat her. Then it becomes a question of, is, he, is his beating of her severe enough that she's entitled to divorce, right? And there, the question of what is severe and what is not and absolutely comes out. And that's why, again, you need female judges, because then female judges will, will get the female point of view about it's humiliating to be even slapped once on your face, right? And that's what Khulud is introducing to the yeah. system, right? But it, the criminal law system that gets in, right? Because she can get divorced by saying, he beats me, but she can also go to the criminal system and say, he beats me and that's physical assault and so I want to charge him with assault. So know that the case doesn't drop and go, but you can have multiple cases in multiple venues. Thank you, let's, uh, yes. The uniforms? Huh? The uniforms? The oh, the hats. Oh, oh, I think. The, the, the Sharia judges are trained in a judicial training college and that's what they wear. So it's not a religious system, it's actually a very state-based system 
of training judges. And there is a judicial training college, and it, and it trains those who want to go to the civilian system and those who want to go to the Sharia system. In other words, that thing that you see, those judges with these dresses, uh, that's a production of the state system, of this college. All right, thank right. you. So it's thank not you anything independent, religious, or any, any of that. Let's take those two, please. Yeah. Yeah. How are these orders enforced? Orders enforced? Yeah, how, how are the orders of the, the state Sharia enforces judges? Them. Like, there for is example, you don't pay the 1,000 shekels for the, that the judge has ordered. How are her orders enforced? Or well, if you're non-compliant, what happens? Well, the, the, the state has devised ways of, like there is, um, you can go identify his employer and you can garnish his wages, right? You can, uh, um, uh, uh, um, and of course, there are many venues of escaping this, right? But that becomes a, a, that goes to a different arm of the judiciary, the executive arm, the arm that wants to implement. And garnishing wages through the employer is the most effective way of going. But many people escape. Many run out of the country. Many avoid the sum. I mean, yes, it's a tricky operation, especially when you think that Palestinians in diaspora are more than the Palestinians in Palestine. And there's a route out of Palestine to the United States. I've, I've worked as, um, I've been hired by law firms in this country to be an expert witness uh, for many wives who are basically coming after their husbands here because they have run into their eviction so as not to pay their maintenance, right? Um, I've also had to speak for women whose husbands are following them here to try and get them to and get them back to Palestine. So venue avenues of escape are open yeah. because of this line of familial support that Palestinians have from the territories have with the diaspora. Um, and I should say that one important difference in the Islamic family system is that. The, uh, there are many things that you would never have a U.S. family law look into. Like there is no such thing as financial support during marriage in in, in the U.S. family law. And U.S. family law is like if he's not spending money on you, divorce him. I can I, I can I can basically have something to say about your alimony. But if, if, but in the Islamic world, there actually the court looks into the details of an ongoing marriage. Here, our family law is about divorce. Over there, it's an ongoing marriage. There are many women who don't want to divorce their husbands. What they want is for him to pay maintenance because they know they'll be impoverished if they get divorced. So maintenance is their way to financial access from the dude. And so a lot of family courts, that's what they do, trying to find the husband to get him to pay for his wife. Many of them are escaping this obligation because they now have a second wife or a third wife. And, it's like and that. so on. Yes. And then in the back, correct. Um, a few quick questions. Uh, does uh, Indonesia follow Sharia law? Yes. And where is it on the spectrum? No idea. Okay. <laughs> um, what I noticed. I know about the Arab world. I don't know anything about Tunisia, Indonesia, but I know they're they're active feminists pushing for uh, family law reforms over there too. They're everywhere. Now, I noticed in the beginning there was uh, questioning of uh, neighbors and other people regarding the dissolution of the marriage. And uh, a lot of the questions were directed as to um, what the uh, husband would pay once the marriage was dissolved. Um, considering that a man is entitled to up to four wives, uh, is there any consideration for the marriage officiant to question whether or not uh, the husband can support all four wives and issues from that marriage? Well, um, first of all, a, a clarification. Men are entitled to financially support their wives only in, as, the, as the marriage is ongoing. After divorce, he's only obligated to financially support his children until they come of age. He's not obligated to spend money on his divorcee except for the three months immediately after divorce. These are the three months that he has the right to what we say return her, go back mm -hmm. on divorcing her, right? It's only throughout these three months or nine months if she was pregnant does he have a financial obligation. There's no alimony in the system. 
right? But during marriage, during marriage, um, the Arab countries are different in what they allow the officiate to ask the people, um, the man when he wants. Egypt introduced the requirement that the first wife, if he wants to take another wife, there is an obligation in the system that she is informed that her husband is taking an, a second wife, and then she has the right not to stop the marriage, but to demand divorce herself, mm -hmm. right? So no, they will not ask you whether you can financially support the wife or not, but they can inform the other woman that you're about to take a second wife, and then she can push for divorcing the husband. And then Thank you, Professor, more. for your eloquent explanation of all of these types of laws. As a non-attorney, but someone interested in advocacy for Palestinians, particularly in the West, what can you tell us uh, to expect in terms of equality for women in the courts so that there can be this idea that they're doing as well as Israel or something like that? You mean what are the prospects? Yes, the prospects, thanks. I don't know, what do you think? You've seen the movie as much as I have. Where is that going? <laughs> I think there is certainly push, it's an increment, I would say it's incremental uh, reform. Um, I think that what is happening in Tunisia is extremely helpful because it can, a feminist activist can point to it as what is possible in the Arab country and uh, um, and the kind of, um, I mean, we're like, well, what's so special about Tunisians? You know, like, why can't Palestinian women get what Tunisian women have? Like, we're the same people, right? Same religion, same language, same whatever. Um, and that I think, and also it sort of guides the activists who want to reform on how hard to push and in what direction. And so I'm very hopeful. I think what the Tunisians are doing is yes. incredible. Um, yes. I, I think the, yes, and then in the back and in the front, yes. Assalamu alaikum. My question is, as many issues discussed in the film, such as situations of rape um, and domestic violence against women are seen, much of the problem, I think, is that these issues are steeped in patriarchal culture and tradition within the Middle East. And I would like to know, what will it take, do you think, to inspire widespread change in this region towards, as you discussed before, liberal forces? I think, I am very hopeful. I think that there are clusters of feminist activism across the borders of the Arab world that are happening as a result of social media. And there are spaces that are doing better than other places, but they are inspiring the other places. Um, I see, for instance, on my newsfeed that Egyptians react to what else, like there's a huge debate on sexual harassment in Lebanon right now because the country mm -hmm. is trying to pass a new law on sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Lebanese men don't like it one bit. But Lebanese <laughs> feminist activists are actually developing unbelievably kind of um, uh, powerful arguments to support the law. Egyptian feminists are watching the scene, learning, feeding the other activists of what to say, but also looking at the possibilities of Lebanon in order to move to Egypt. That, that kind of interaction with the speed in with which it's happening and the communities that are being built as a result of social media, that's really new. Yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, and I would add something else that makes many people uneasy, but I am completely fine, fine with it. And that is that Europeans are actually financing civil society groups that are pushing for family law reform, mm -hmm. particularly the Scandinavians. I think they mm -hmm. have decided that this is an issue that's worth investing in, Correct. and they are investing in it. Mm -hmm. And hooray for the Europeans for doing it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because this is such a, you know, the sort of the, what feminists are doing is, are penetrating a socially conservative, it's not this country where you have conservatives and then you have the liberals, and these are like two warring tribes lives, right? But the liberals hold their ground, they have their spaces and, and they've made wins in the law and all of that and conservatives are pushing back and they're getting this dude in the White House to help them. 
It's not like that. There, you must, you have to think of socially of conservatism being the overarching dominant group, and liberals are like few in between, and they're like pushing, pushing, pushing. They need all the help that they can get. And if Europeans are allowing for these activists to make a living by pushing that, that they're all the power to them, I don't have a problem with that at all. Absolutely. We have time for one last question. I'm going to take the young man in the back. I'm sorry, but we're running out of time. Please. Thank you so much. Um, so I had a couple questions I wanted to ask you. Um, one is that we noticed that um, in the hearings that uh, Judge Khulud uh, conducted, she would ask for information. So for example, how much is needed to provide or maintain for this person financially and use testimonies and oral testimonies as a basis for Islamic law. Is there any system to kind of verify the information or evidence? Um, or how, how do they ensure that the information they get is correct? And the second question is about the um, Tunisia. So, you know, since Sharia courts are intended to kind of implement the Sharia, um, a lot of people have made the argument that, you know, the Sharia is quite clear about inheritance laws for women and that women can't marry non Muslim men uh, and that this, I mean, the structure of the marriage con contract you know, shouldn't be, can't be changed. So what is the um, Tunisian uh, Sharia uh, court uh, religious argument, or what are the basis, the religious basis for the changes that they've made? Um, and you know, what was their interpretation? And my last that, quick question no, We is, have time for, for one. I will take your okay. first two. Thank okay, you. Okay, okay very quickly. <laughs> Um, usually what happens when the judge is trying to, uh, to evaluate how much, uh, say, the husband is obligated to pay his wife, either for her or for the children under her custody, um, she brings witnesses as to his financial capacity. He brings witnesses as to his financial capacity, right? And then the judge decides what's more accurate. Okay, so the judge can ask, well, show me how much do you have in the bank? Show me your bank statement. She can, she can get someone to call his employer and the employer can verify. So what you have seen is just a, a shot. And I suspect that in these cases, she was trying to do hukum ghiyabi. Like she's yes. issuing a decision that the husband didn't show up mm. for court. The woman needs the money right away. And she's asking whoever, with, there are witnesses who knows him of what, and she's making this ruling that that's what, he can come to court and question that ruling, right? But usually there are verifications, both sides bring their own witnesses, right? And both witnesses, okay. The second question, what are the Tunisians saying about these strict rules? Tunisians from the beginning, from the 50s, when they decided polygamy is illegal, which goes against the strict textual source, right, that in the Quran says you have the right to marry the more than one, they've come up with this idea. Um, it's all histor historical. This used to work in the end before. It doesn't have to work now. Um, uh, we can always, um, and this is what I read in the, in the latest report uh, by the Tunisians about the new reforms. They, they keep s saying this, reason prevails over text. Al-aql fawq al Thank you so much, uh, Professor Abu Aude, for being with us and for giving us all this insight. Thank you all for coming.